Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and John Payne in Wings of the Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Brave men going down to the sea in ships have written a glorious history for the United States Navy. Over the years, they've brought new honor to the great names of John Paul Jones, Stephen Decatur, Oliver H. Perry, and Admiral George Dewey. In ships of wood and ships of iron, under sail and steam, they've served notice to the world that this land must be respected. Today, that tradition lives on in ships of steel, that guard the ramparts of the sea, and in ships of silver that guard the ramparts of the sky, our first line of defense. This new frontier of the air provides the background for tonight's exciting drama, Wings of the Navy. And we have the original stars of the Warner Brothers picture, George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and John Payne. It's a saga of those men of destiny who do their daily work at two, three, four hundred miles an hour. We throw the spotlight on two of these men, Two brothers, played tonight by George Brent and John Payne. They're both daredevils, and they're both in love with the same girl, which won't be hard to understand, because the girl is played by Olivia de Havilland. I think it's fitting that a story like this should be brought to you by a national theater. And we're grateful to the millions of you who have made this a national theater by your loyalty to the product behind it, Lux Toilet Soap. We look to your letters for guidance in producing these plays, your comments make pleasant reading for us, not only in what you say about our plays, but what you tell us about Lux Toilet Soap. Now there's adventure in the air and a thrill in every cloud as the curtain goes up on Act One of Wings of the Navy, starring George Brent as Cass Harrington, Olivia de Havilland as Irene Dale, and John Payne as Jerry Harrington. Arlington Cemetery, where great men of America lie at rest, is a national shrine dedicated to those whose lives were given in service to their country. On a bright spring morning, a crowd has gathered to pay tribute to the memory of another hero, William Harrington, Admiral, United States Navy. Uniformed officers stand stiffly at attention, their eyes on the speaker's platform. Among them are Jerry and Cass Harrington, sons of the man to be honored. Far overhead, a fleet of airplanes soars in battle formation, a jagged spearhead against the fleecy clouds. And today we dedicate this monument to the memory of Admiral William Harrington. It is a small thing compared to the monument Admiral Harrington created for himself in the hearts of those who served with him. Along the coast of America and far at sea, steam a majestic array of fighting craft. Mammoth battleships, destroyers, silent deadly submarines that prowl the ocean depths. This is the battle fleet of the United States Navy. And in the skies soars an armada of steel and thunder. Graceful battleships of the clouds, defying the blackness of night, breathing challenge to the fury of storm and lightning. These are the wings of the Navy. Death often rode the wings of the fleet in earlier days, but from the beginning, through sheer determination, through sacrifice of life and limb, the Navy has progressed to the point where today it can fill the heavens with the most powerful fighting force in the world. Admiral Harrington and others of his day paved the way for its existence by giving all they had to the service they loved. And today, men are giving their lives to maintain and improve our greatest safeguard against war, a great and powerful Navy. It is not only to Admiral Harrington, but to the men of the United States Naval Aviation, to those who fly today and to those who will ride the Navy wings of tomorrow, that we dedicate this monument. Well, Jerry, 
I guess we can feel pretty proud. Yeah, but it's too bad a fellow has to be gone ten years before they start praising him. He's not gone. He had a peculiar belief in immortality, Jerry. He believed that so long as there was a Harrington in the Navy, he'd be part of it. I guess that leaves it up to us. Well, Lieutenant Harrington, uh, just a moment, will you please? Yes, what is it? I'm from the Daily News, Lieutenant. Can we get a picture of you? Sure, go ahead. Well, thanks. Okay, Herb, over here. Oh, say, young fellow, you. Who, me? Yes, would you mind stepping aside, young fellow? We just sure. want Lieutenant Harrington in this. His name is Harrington, too. He's my brother. Yeah, but he ain't news. What's he do? He's in the submarine service. Oh, the Hawks got a turtle for a kid brother, eh? Lieutenant, I understand that you have designed a new fighting plane. Can you tell us about it? Oh, it's not that far along yet. Okay. All right, Irv, shoot it. Well, thanks, Lieutenant. You designed a new submarine, young fellow, and you'll get your picture in the paper, too. <laughs> Come on, Irv, there's an admiral over here. Well, I, I guess he put me in my place, all right. <laughs> and see that you stay there. Well, I've got to get over to the field. Walking that way? Sure. You flying back to Pensacola, Cass? Yeah, I've got to get there tonight. Uh, some guys have all the luck, don't they? Hey, Cass, wait up. Hiya, Harry. Hiya. You ready to leave? Yeah. Jerry, this is Harry White. He's an instructor with me at Pensacola. Hiya. Glad to know you. Say, Cass, how do you go about getting a transfer from submarine to aviation? What? You don't. But it can be done, can't it? You haven't got that flying bug again, have you? <laughs> it bites me every time I see you in the air. I want to trade this sub insignia for wings. Well, forget it. Why? Because I said so. You aren't the type. What kind of a guy is the type? Does he have to have feathers? Look, forget it. You're not going to transfer. All right, Pop, all right. But did it ever occur to you that I might grow up someday? No. You might be surprised. So long. I'll see you at the field. So long. And well, that's the first time I ever heard you try to unsell anyone on flying. What's the angle, Cass? Oh, Jerry doesn't like being a kid brother, I guess. The difference in our ages gave me a head start, so he's always trying to find a shortcut to top me. When we were kids, he nearly broke his neck trying to outfly me, and he nearly drowned trying to outswim me. And if he goes to Pensacola, you're afraid he'll break his neck trying to outfly you. Yeah, that's right. Well, he might be good, Cass. He is good. But when he's competing with me, something happens to him, and he's a bust. That's why I want him to stay in the submarine service. He won't be under my influence, and he'll wind up with a record that'll make mine look like something scratched on the side of a barn. <laughs> in other words, he isn't entirely hopeless. Ah, he's a great kid. I'd give him a right arm for him. While I was doing it, I'd hang my left on his chin at the same time. Well, I'll see you at the field, Cass. All set? Yeah. I wish that brother of yours would show up. We're late. Ah, uh, he'll be here. Tell me some more about those big ships, Harry. <laughs> what for? You heard, Papa. You're going to stick to submarines. Oh, there he is. Cass, come on! Hey, that can't be Cass. He's got a girl with him. Hurry up, will you? All ready, Harry. Goodbye, darling. Take care of yourself. Goodbye, Cass. Oh, Jerry, this is Irene Dale. Irene, this is my kid brother. Cass! Coming. So long, darling. So long, Jerry. Yeah. See you in Pensacola. No, you won't. Goodbye. Goodbye, Cass. Hello. Hello. Say, did I see my brother kissing you just now? Well, I don't know. Were you watching? Yeah, I thought it was an optical illusion. I can't imagine Cass taking time enough off from flying to fall in love with anyone. Oh, he managed. You see, we have a schedule. He flies six days out of the week, and we meet every other Sunday from three to five, and that allows plenty of time for aviation and romance. Oh, I see. Here, let me look at you. Mm, I can understand, all right. You know, I just met you, but if you had a twin sister and there was a moon... I'd be asking her to share my entire fortune, consisting of three uniforms, a gunnery medal, and a sword. My twin sister would be flattered if I had one. Yeah, but I was talking about me. With Cass, it's different. He isn't human, you know. Really? Nope. He's just a built-in accessory to an airplane. He's got a carburetor for a heart, and it pumps blue and gold gasoline. Why, the only thing he's been in love with in the last ten years is an air-cooled rotary engine. Oh, yes, I heard about that affair. But it's all over now. We have an understanding. Uh, who? You and the engine? Yes, we're going to divide him. Is that Cass coming? He's awfully low, isn't he? Hey, hey look out! Well, how do you like that? My own brother tries to murder me. What was that he threw out? Uh, here it is. Here's a note. For me? Probably. Let's see. If you come to Pensacola, I'll break your neck. Does he mean you or me? <laughs> he means me. Good morning, Lieutenant. Good morning, sir. Well, what do we got here? Cadets, sir, just off the train. Are they all checked in? Yes, sir, 21 of them. My report says 22. Well, must have gotten lost. 
Welcome to Pensacola, gentlemen. <coughs> gentlemen, I take it for granted you are all anxious and eager to become part of the United States Navy. Let it be understood, please, that the desire to serve is highly commendable, but not necessarily an indication that you're fit for this service. You'll all be given a thorough physical examination, followed by an intelligence test. If the results are satisfactory, you'll be assigned to barracks and your training will begin. For a certain period, you'll be schooled in the mechanics of aviation. You'll fly first to observe, then with an instructor, handling the controls yourself. When you're ready, you'll be given a solo flight to be followed in time by an examination in instrument flying. All of these are in the nature of tests. Pass them, and you'll be with us for some time. Fail them once too often, and you're on your way out. You'll each receive a rule book. You'll be required to observe every one of these rules. You must understand that they're formulated for your own good and the good of the Navy. Their purpose is to turn out the finest flying personnel in the world. Is there anything else I can explain? Yes, sir. When do we fly? Oh, eventually. Not until then. <laughs> That'll be all for now, gentlemen. Uh, Lieutenant Harrington. Yes, sir. You might try to round up that lost sheep. Yes, sir. I'll take a look around the field. Hey, Mac. See a cadet around here? Not today. Hiya, Cass. Hi, Harry. Have a good trip? Smoothest glass all the way from San Diego. Hey, give me a hand, will you? I've got a passenger. Passenger? Where? He's on the floor. Oh, where, Seca? <laughs> He's been dying ever since we took off. All right, come on, kid. Yep, up you go. Stand out on the wing, kid. Oh, uh, hello. Jerry. Uh, hi, Cass. Jerry, what are you doing here? Well, I'm I'm going to be an aviator, and I... I oh. Jerry! He's out cold. Yeah, come on. Let's get him over to the barracks. Now, drink this. Here. What is it? It's medicine for air sickness. Air sickness. <laughs> They're still laughing at you over at the officers' club. I ought to knock your block off. It's a fine welcome I get to Pensacola, and from my own flesh and blood, Quit too. trying to be funny. I don't know how you wangled yourself into getting ordered here, but you're going back to your pig boats. No, you're trying to be funny. Why don't you quit before you disgrace the name of Harrington? Look, Cass, I know what I'm doing. Sure, sure. So does a kid playing with a machine gun. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to learn to fly, and when I do, I'm going to fly the pants off of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figured that was it. You don't want to be a good Navy flyer. All you're interested in is flying my pants off, and that's where you're going to be a flop. If I do, that'll be my business, won't it? Yeah. All right. All right. From now on, you're on your own. I'm going to pretend you're not here. And if you get into a jam, you'll get out of it yourself. I'm going to leave you strictly alone. Is that a promise? Yes, that's a promise. Now, come on. Take your medicine. <laughs> Back on that stick to start the takeoff. You've got to get her up on the step or she won't move. I'll let you in on a secret. Hitting the water is bad for the pop. This is what we call a gosport. It's a speaking tube that allows the instructor to talk to the student, but the student can't talk back, which is the whole idea. I'm not waving at angels when I do this, kid. I mean, your right wing's too low. Now bring it up. Relax, kid. You're stiff as a rail. This is what's known as a loop. Your snap rolls ragged, kid. Never freeze the stick. You lose flying speed, you spin. Turn your nose up. Ah. And just remember this. Any landing you walk away from is a good one. Hi, Cass. So what do you think you're doing? Oh, just admiring myself and your mirror. Somehow, I don't find this outfit quite dashing enough for a Navy flyer. You know, Congress ought to do something about it. Well, don't worry. Nobody will see you when you're flying but your instructor. Yeah, but suppose you make a forced landing in a bean patch and the farmer's rosy-cheeked daughter comes out with apple pie for the mm -hmm. wounded heroes. If you ever land on a bean patch with one of those primary seaplanes, you won't be interested in the farmer's daughter. Ah, those primary seaplanes are a headache. Say, Cass, is it hard to get assigned to the big boats? What's that got to do with you? Well, I want to command a big boat and... Take a mass flight to Midway, Alaska. That's the branch of the service with a future in it. I don't want to be a dizzy fighting pilot all my life. That's marvelous. That's marvelous. You don't know the first thing about flying, and already you're commanding big boats. 
Well, you can't stop a fella from hoping, can you? You can't stop him from being a dope, either. Oh, I don't know. I'm doing all right. I take my solo this afternoon. Solo? Well, you're not ready, Jerry. Ah, uh, don't be silly. Now, listen, Why? listen. There's lots of things I've been wanting to say to you. I've been watching your flying. You're terrible. You've been fooling... Wait a minute. You were going to pretend I'm not here. You weren't going to give me any help or advice. That was a promise, wasn't it? Yeah, well, okay, Jerry, you're on your own. But try to keep your neck in one piece, will you? What's the matter? You worried about me? No, I'm thinking about myself. Irene's coming down here next week, and I don't want anything to spoil it. Okay. Say, how did she ever go for a guy like you? I don't know. I can't figure it. Uh, when do you solo? Three o'clock. Gonna watch me? Thanks. I've got more important things on my mind. Harry. Harry, is that Jerry up there? Yeah. How's he doing? I don't know. He's been twice around the bay. Coming in too fast. Well, give him the signal. I did. Here he comes again. Easy. Easy now, kid. Relax. Forward on the stick. Easy, easy. You left wings too low. Bring it up. Bring it up. Look at him. He's heading for the seawall. Up. Up. Gun it. Gun it, you... Are you hurt? Jerry. Uh, sir, I I wish to report a crash. Jerry, are you hurt? Uh, uh, no, sir. Oh, well, it's too bad you aren't. You deserve to break your neck. <laughs> Did anyone ever tell you that you dance divinely, Mr. Harrington? Sure. That's the only thing I can do better than cats. Oh. <laughs> you know, Irene, it was swell of you folks to drag me along tonight. Not that I blame you. What do you mean? Well, does Cass always draw airplane designs on your tablecloth? Oh, yes, always. Here she is, Cass. I uh, I think I ought to tell you. She says I dance divinely. Wait a second now, wait a second, wait a second. Shh, don't sorry. disturb him. He's drawing designs. Who is he, do you know? Uh, Dokes is the name, I think, lady. Dokes, oh, of course. Joseph P. Dokes, the mad inventor. Naturally, I know him. Oh, hello. I know you. You're going to be Mrs. Dokes, remember? Mrs. Dokes. That sounds perfectly horrible. Next time a man asks me to marry him, I'm going to find out his name before I say yes. Look, I found out what's the matter with the wing surface of my fighter. See, Irene? That's what your life's going to be like. Instead of moonlight and roses, it'll be wing surfaces and empennage designs. Oh, that's an old story already. You know, when we dance, Cass isn't keeping time to the music. He's counting RPMs. And to think I had to come all the way to Pensacola to play second fiddle to an overpowered flying machine. That's all right, sweetheart. After this, it'll be worse. Could it be? I hardly see you as it is. You won't see me at all for a week or so. I've beefed up the center sections, and I'm taking my designs to Washington. The Navy has asked for them, and believe me, this time the plane will be accepted. Oh, darn that plane. Oh, wait a minute. You don't know when you're well off, Irene. Cass and his plane will be gone, but you'll still have me. Will I? Yeah, and I'll make up for all the good times Cass has been cheating you out of. We'll dance every night. No matinees? We'll play tennis and ride horseback. Uh-huh. Will you have any time for flying? Uh, don't mind him. And we'll swim. Oh, you're going to make a marvelous brother-in-law, Mr. Cass. Can you make it a month, darling? Nope. One week probation is all you get. After that, you're going to be an old man's darling again. In the meantime, let's dance. Had enough? I could swim to Key West. <laughs> well, I couldn't. Come on, get up on the raft. Give me a hand. Up you go. I bet my hair's soaked. What's the matter? What are you staring at, Jerry? You? I'm going to have to put you back in the hothouse. This outdoor life is giving you freckles. Really? Me without a mirror? Are there many? Did you ever see a turkey egg? Oh, is it that bad? <laughs> oh, don't worry. I like girls with freckles. That covers a lot of territory. I'll narrow down the field a little bit. I'll include you and your twin sister. I told you I haven't got a twin sister. Oh, that's right, but... Think how swell it would be if there was another one like you. I could really go for your sister. Do you think she'd like me? I think... I think she might like you a lot. I hope so, because... Well, you see, she'd be my idea of something perfect. She wouldn't be as perfect as you think. She'd be selfish, for one thing. She'd want so terribly to be happy that she'd make mistakes. And then she wouldn't have the courage to do anything about them. Sometimes she'd be pretty disgusted with herself. Ah, uh, she wouldn't be that way at all. She'd have a lot of courage. She'd be generous and kind. Why, just being near her and helping to make her happy would be the greatest break a fellow could ever expect to have. Having you feel that way would... 
Give her more happiness than she deserved, Jerry. Look, Irene. Yes? Well, I was just thinking. Cass will be back sometime today, and... I know. Nah, he's a great guy, that brother of mine. Yes. A great guy. Jerry, let's go back, shall we? Sure, he might be in by now. Hey, Irene. There he is. Hello, you two. Hello, Cass. You look happy. You must have good news. Good news? I'm loaded with it. The Navy Department is going ahead with my plane. Oh, Cass, that's wonderful. But wait a minute. I'm also promoted to the noble estate of Lieutenant Commander. Oh, congratulations, Cass. And as for you, Jerry, you're liable to be Lieutenant Junior Grade pretty soon if you keep your nose clean. You've been selected, too. Yeah, that's swell. Swell? Is that all you can say? Well, I'm tickled to death. Well, then why don't you act like it? What's the matter, flat hat? You in trouble or something? No, I'm all right. Mm, I know what it is. The first promotion always does that to you. Drive me to headquarters, will you, darling? I want to say something to you that isn't any of Jerry's business. We'll let him walk. Maybe it'll help pull him out of his tailspin. All right. Goodbye, Jerry. So long. Jerry, where are you? Here. What do you want? I've been looking for you. Why aren't you out flying? I don't feel so good. No? Well, I talked to the doctor, and he says there's nothing wrong with you. Did he? Yes. Looks to me as if you're just moping. Why don't you snap out of it? Well, I'm, I'm sick of flying. You what? I'm sick of flying. Oh, you're not sick of flying. You're sick in the head. Now, all right, what is it? What's it all about this time? I told you, I'm sick of flying. Now, you ought to know you can't kid me. You've got something important on your mind. Now, what is it? Look, Cass, there are some things in my life that don't concern you. Ooh, romance is wonderful, isn't it? What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I recognize the symptoms. Every time you get a case of love, you go Shakespeare on me. You're Romeo and she's Juliet, and you always wind up under a balcony. Who's the girl this time? None of your... There isn't any girl. Mm, now, let's see, let's see. Now, it couldn't be that redhead. She's not your type. And the Spencer girl married that Marine. Now, let me see. I've been gone a week. Oh, there's only one you've seen. Why don't you shut up? Get out of here and let me alone, will you? Oh, I guess maybe it's serious this time, huh? Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> After a short intermission, Mr. DeMille presents George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and John Payne in the second act of Wings of the Navy. Over on Morton Street, a cheerful postman is hurrying up the steps of the Douglas home. Oh, here you are. Miss Joan Douglas, this little box is for you. Looks like you're getting a present. Oh, thanks, I've been waiting for it. Gosh, I can't wait to unwrap it. Oh, it's gorgeous. Mother, come here quick. Look what I've got. Oh, your brooch came, dear. That is handsome. Let me see it closer. Why, it's so rich looking. It'll be perfect with that green silk jersey dress. Hooray for Lux toilet soap. Dum, da, da, dum. Dum, da, da, dum. That's the Lux toilet soap theme Joan was humming. Did you recognize it? Lux toilet soap. And that's the answer to how you can get one of these stunning simulated cameo brooches. A brooch designed after the one worn by lovely Vivian Lee and Gone with the Wind. Now here's what you do. Buy three cakes of Lux toilet soap from your dealer and ask him for a handy order blank. Or write your name and address on a piece of paper, send it with the wrappers from three cakes of Lux toilet soap and 15 cents in coin, no stamps please, to Lux toilet soap box one, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. When your Scarlet O'Hara brooch comes, you'll be just as keen about it as Joan was. The pure white head on a glistening ebony background is encircled with a delicate Grecian border design. The setting is gold finished and there's a fine safety clasp. It's a real jewelry piece you'll be proud to wear. With your brooch, you'll receive an illustrated order blank telling you how you can get additional matching pieces to complete your Scarlet O'Hara ensemble. A ring, bracelet, pendant, earrings, all of the same beautiful design as the brooch 
and all at amazing bargains. Remember the address. Lux Toilet Soap, Box 1, New York City. And remember, too, that Gentle Lux Toilet Soap has active lather. Active lather that 9 out of 10 screen stars use for their price priceless complexions. Remember, on your shopping list for tomorrow, three cakes of Gentle White Lux Toilet Soap. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Wings of the Navy, starring George Brent as Cass Harrington, Olivia de Havilland as Irene Dale, and John Payne as Jerry Harrington. <laughs> Pensacola, proving ground of Navy airmen, where fledglings try their wings. Many of them thunder valiantly into the clouds, keeping their courses straight and true to their goal, while others falter and slip fluttering in gloriously to the ground. One of these fledglings is just coming in, his ship bouncing crazily, sliding to a stop. All right, kid, cut your motor. It wasn't so good, Ormsby. Oh, I know it, sir. I'm sure that... Well, I know I can do better, sir. We don't gamble on promises, kid. Take my chute over to the office. I'll see you there in ten minutes. Do, does that mean I, I'm busted out? Did you hear me? I said I'll see you in ten minutes. Now, go on. Yes. Hiya, Harry. Hiya, Cass. I was watching upstairs there. Kid flopped on you, huh? Yeah, bad. Gee, it's a shame. He was a good kid. I know it. That's why I hate to see him busted out. Want me to give him another check? I don't know. Might be a good idea at that. Maybe I've got the Indian sign on him. Okay, I'll do it this afternoon. Meanwhile, I'll go and have a talk with him. Thanks, Cass. Oh, don't thank me. You yanked Jerry out of his slump. If I can save a student for you, why, we still won't be even. Oh, uh, wait, wait a minute. Look, Cass, watch your step. This Ormsley kid has a tendency to freeze the stick. Yeah? I had to slug him once and let go. I'll watch him. Hey, uh, isn't that your lady friend? Yeah, that reminds me. I did have a date. See you this afternoon, Harry. Right. Cass, are you ready? Oh, hello, darling. I thought I'd come down and pick you up. Well, uh, look, Irene, I, I can't make it. I've got to give a cadet a special check flight. I'm trying to save him from being busted out. Oh, I'm well, sorry. Well, I'll be through about four o'clock. Why don't you dig Jerry up? No, I, uh, I think I'll just wait for you. On second thought, maybe that's a good idea. Why? Well, Jerry's undergoing a case of growing pains known as puppy love. You better not see him till he gets over it. What have I got to do with it? Well, I'm not sure, but I think you're the one he's in love with. Did he say that? <laughs> no, I'm just psychic. Cass, listen. Now, to now, don't let it worry you. I know Jerry. He'll get over it in a week. He always does. So just forget it, will you? All right, Cass. Irene. Hello. Say, you weren't going to pass me up, were you? I'm sorry I didn't see you, Jerry. What are you doing down here? I thought you had a date with Cass this afternoon. I did. He's busy. I'm going to wait. Oh. Shall we sit down? You haven't been seeing much of Cass, have you? Not very much. Well, he's had a lot to do, I guess. Maybe it's just as well. Why? What's the matter, Irene? Is something wrong? No, except that not seeing Cass has given me time to think things over. And I know now that I almost made a mistake that would have hurt him as well as me. Jerry, I'm going to tell Cass I can't marry him. Have you two been quarreling? No, he's been as sweet to me as ever. That's why it's going to be so difficult to tell him. Then don't. I'm, I mean, not right away. Think it over, huh? I have been thinking it over. Cass was gone a week, and he's been back three days. And during that time, I've come to realize that I'm not in love with him. Mm, that's, that's pretty serious, isn't it? He's crazy about you, Irene. Would it be fair to marry him feeling the way I do? I don't know. I, all I do know is that He's the finest brother in the world. He's square and he's honest and he's... He's all of that, Jerry. That's what attracted me to him. But I was wrong when I thought that it was love. I can't marry him. You can't marry a person when... when you're in love with someone else. Look, I, I Don't mean... Don't say it, Jerry, please. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You know how I feel and I think I know how you feel. And we can't even talk about it. Neither of us wanted it this way. 
We've both been fighting against it. Sometimes things happen to people that they can't help. But they don't want to happen. And it's happened to us. What about Cass? Does it solve anything to make him unhappy, too? I'd make him more unhappy if I married him. Oh, Jerry, I know how you hate to hurt Cass, and I love you for it. But it can't change things between Cass and me. You figure things out for yourself. No matter what you decide. I'm going to try to live up to whatever code of ethics I have. Hello, Mac. Is Cass around? No, oh, afternoon, Miss Dale. Cass is up there with Ormsby, see him? Oh, do you suppose he would be long? Well, he's been up almost an hour right now. If anybody can take the kinks out of that kid, Cass is the man. Holy mu... Mac, what was that supposed to be? Snap roll, but it didn't come off. I'd like to see a little more altitude right now. What do you mean, Mac? That kid freezes the... St- Put her out, Cass! Put her out! Mac, what's the matter? He's going into a spin! Pull out! Pull out! Cass! Oh, Cass! Right now. Take it easy, kid. Shove her nose down and give her the gun and then start pulling back. I can't. It won't move. Come on, come on, relax. Better let me have that stick. Let go, kid. Come on, loosen up. I can't move it. Let go, do you hear? Let go of that stick. I can't. Let go. Are you crazy? We're gonna crash. We're gonna crash. Give me that stick. Give it to me. Give me that stick. Can I go in now? I think so. How's he going to be, Doctor? Well, it's hard to say. That left leg is very bad. There's a chance he may never walk again. Don't stay too long. I won't. Thanks, Doc. Hiya, Cass. Hello, Jerry. Come in and see the cripple. Yeah, that was nice flying, mister. Aren't you the guy who was going to give me some pointers? Of course I realize it wasn't all your fault. When I get up out of here, I'll break your neck. If I ever do get up. What are you talking about? Oh, the doc had four specialists in here this morning. They all voted the same ticket. I'm grounded for good. Ah, the woods are full of specialists. They make mistakes, same as anybody else. You'll be as good as new. You'll be in better shape than Ormsby, and he's walking around already. Now, you're not a fortune teller, and you're not a doctor, so why don't you keep quiet? You're not giving up, are you, Cass? I'm just looking facts in the face, and I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm sorry, fella. Hmm, I'm sorry, too. (laughs) Sure. Well, looks like you'll be carrying the ball from now on, Jerry. Well, that won't be so bad. You and Dad ran up a pretty good score. All I have to do is follow the interference. Yes, but you've got to show them the way. You've got to be the best fighting pilot in the Navy. I'm going in for big boats. Oh, yeah, big boats. I forgot. An aerial truck driver on an ice wagon. That's what you'll be. Yeah, well, it takes a darn sight better man to fly a big boat than it does to hurt a fighting hornet. Oh, if you weren't young and stupid, I'd argue with you. And if you weren't old and flip dippy, I'd argue back. A big boat's got a crew like a submarine. When you're in a fighting plane, you're on your own. You're as near as you'll ever come to having wings. You've got the wind in your face, and you're part of the ship, and it's part of you. And the motor's a living thing, and it obeys you. There's nothing over your head but the sky, and you can, you can reach up and touch it. And when you feel happy, you can play like a kid on a blue lawn. You loop and dive and zoom, and you chase clouds like a cat after a ball of yarn, and you... You... Oh, why should I waste my breath? You don't know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do, Cass. I've felt it, too. Sure, sure. Get out, will you? I'm tired. Okay. I'll be in to see you tonight. Jerry. How is he, Jerry? They say he may never walk again. Oh. He'll have to quit the Navy. You know what the service means to him. Yes. Irene, he's lost all that now. All he's got to hang on to is... Well, all he's got left now is... I know, Jerry. Don't worry about it. He's not going to lose me. (laughs) 
In just a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and John Payne will bring you Act Three of Wings of the Navy. And now, let's listen in on a little conversational bridge game played by four charming ladies. Your deal, Mary. Before I pick up this hand, though, I'm going to ask you a question I've been dying to ask all afternoon. Where did you get that stunning cameo brooch you're wearing? Looks like an antique to me. Is it a family heirloom? Well, girls, if I didn't know you so well, I'd just let you keep on thinking that. But I can't help telling you what a bargain I got. This is designed after a brooch worn by Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind. And how much do you think it cost me? Just 15 cents. And wrappers from three cakes of Lux toilet soap. When you see this handsome brooch, you'll say it's simply stunning. It's a simulated stone cameo, a pure white head on a jet background, encircled with a handsome Grecian border in black and gold. It's the kind of expensive-looking jewelry piece that looks equally well with a frilly blouse or a simple tailored dress. You'll get plenty of compliments on your style and good taste when you wear it, because there's nothing cheap or flimsy-looking about this pin. It's made as expensive jewelry is, with a solid back and a fine safety clasp. Its simplicity and good taste will be applauded by the most smartly dressed women. So don't miss your chance to get this wonderful bargain. Here's how you do it. Get an order blank from your grocer tomorrow, or write your name and address on a piece of paper and send it together with the wrappers from three cakes of Lux toilet soap and 15 cents in coin, no stamps please, to Lux toilet soap, box one, New York City. And in a few days, you'll receive your pin. Think of it, only 15 cents and the wrappers from three cakes of Lux toilet soap, the gentle white soap that nine out of 10 screen stars use. With your brooch, you'll receive an illustrated order blank telling you how to get additional matching pieces for your Scarlett O'Hara set. Ring, bracelet, pendant, earrings. Act quickly. This is the last time this offer will be made on this program. Send in your order today. This offer is good only in the United States. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of Wings of the Navy. Several months have passed, and Jerry Harrington's training period at Pensacola is finished. The fledgling has become a hawk, serving now at the Naval Air Station, North Island, San Diego. On the beach, a giant patrol bomber spreads its silver wings across the sand. Beneath these wings stands Jerry, gazing upward, lost in admiration for the power and beauty of the monster ship. He doesn't notice the man who comes to stand behind him, a man who moves slowly, leaning heavily on a cane. If the cavalry ever got in a jam, that thing would carry a good load of hay. Is that so? Well, well, Cass, when did you get here? Oh, you, Jerry? About an hour or so ago. How's the boy? I couldn't be better. How are you, Cass? Oh, fine, fine. I'm allowed to limp around all by myself now. No, I'm not kidding. Is that leg coming along all right? It'll do. So you're flying that big boat now, eh? Yeah, isn't she a beauty? Not bad. Wait until my plane's accepted. You'll fly the wings off of that thing. Don't call that thing a thing. I'm going to fly it to Honolulu. When? Mass flight next month. There are three commands vacant, and I've got mine all picked out. Oh, still the modest boy, <laughs> huh? Well, good luck. Thanks. How about coming along, Cass? I'll bet I could swing it. <laughs> Save yourself the trouble. They don't want one-legged men in the Navy. I found that out when I went before the examining board. I'm grounded for good. Oh, well, there, there are other things beside the Navy. How's Irene? Oh, she's fine. Hadn't been for her that have sewn me up in canvas long ago. Where is she? She's here, staying with relatives until they test my ship. When I get that off my mind, we're going to be married. I know she's anxious to see you. Come on up and say hello to her. Oh, no, no, not, not right now, Cass. I've... I got a few things to do here. Some other time, huh? Well, how's it 
luck, fella. Yeah, it's in great shape, Cass. And that ship of yours will pass any test they want to put it to. Well, keep it good and hot. We're almost ready. Right. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Lieutenant, this is Captain March of the Bureau of Aeronautics. Glad to know you, Captain. I hope your plane comes through, Lieutenant. The Navy can use a ship like that. Well, it's passed everything but the terminal velocity test. If it passes that today, the Navy will owe you a vote of thanks. Having the Navy accept it will be thanks enough. Excuse me, sir. There's the test pilot. Steve, over here. Hi, Cass. All set, Steve? All set. How do you feel? Fine. Well, she's in perfect shape. Take her up to 15,000 feet. Dive her at least 10 before you pull her out. Try to push the needle off the dial. I'll try. Give her the works. Tear the wings off if you can. I don't think you can, but try anyway. Okay. And if you see she won't take it, don't forget to bail out in time. Listen, Cass, my wife's giving a birthday party tonight for the kids. I'll bring your crate down in one piece. Thanks, Steve, but give it all it'll take. Okay, Mac, we're ready. Looks like he's got enough altitude. Why doesn't he turn it down? I told him 15,000 feet. He'll be coming any minute now. Good luck, Lieutenant. Thank you, sir. Jerry. Oh, hi, Irene. Come down to see the test? Yes. And to see you. Why have you been avoiding me, Jerry? Well, I've, I've been pretty busy and... Don't you realize you're creating exactly the impression you don't want to create? Cass wonders why you've been finding excuses not to go out with us. What can I do, Irene? I've we tried... We made a bargain, Jerry. What else is there to do but make the best of it? Let's be grown up. Let's behave as if nothing had happened. We'll meet and we'll be friends. And we'll be happy because Cass will be happy. Okay. Here it comes. You better watch this. It's a big moment for Cass. How far is he taking it, Lieutenant? Well, I told him to bring it down to 5,000. It's coming awfully fast. He'll be all right. Those wings hang on at that speed. We've really got a plane. They'll hang on. I'd say it was less than 5,000 right now. Well, he'll turn it up in a second. Come on, Steve. There he goes. He's in a spin. Pull out. Pull out, Steve. Pull it out. Turn it up. What's the matter with it? He's going to crash if he doesn't. Jump, Steve. Jump, fella. Don't take a chance. Bail out. Bail out. Cass, darling, please don't take it so hard. It wasn't your fault. Oh, snap out of it, Cass. Come on. You've got another ship ready for testing? Sure. And somewhere, I suppose, there's another test pilot like Steve, ready to die in a coffin designed by Cass Harrington, huh? Well, how do you know it was the plane that failed? Maybe it was Steve. It ought to be a breeze to take it through that test. I could do it myself. Oh, you could. Do you know what a pilot goes through when he makes a terminal velocity dive? Well, I have an idea. No, you haven't. You've got to take a cranky, unknown experimental plane up to 15,000 feet. Open your throttle and shoot yourself at the earth like a cannonball. You're smashed back in your seat. You gasp for air. The wind is like a thousand knives that rip and tear at your wings. You're going three or four hundred miles an hour straight down. Then you pull back in the stick, and when you do, believe me, you pray. And the air is turned into a brick wall. And if the seat isn't stressed for 2,000 pounds, you bust right through it. And all of a sudden, your plane and your body are shooting upward. What's inside of you keeps on falling. Your blood drains, everything goes black. You can't see, you can't breathe, and you're knocked out cold. And if you're lucky, you come to before you crash. And then you might find that you're in a death trap. You try to jump, and it's too late. Something like that happened to Steve today. Does that sound like a job for a kid like you? No, I suppose not. But even a guy like me can have faith in what his brother's trying to do. Am I out of place, Cass? No, no, you aren't out of place. And I'm not giving up. Not yet, anyway. be a test pilot willing to take the job. Keep on trying. Offer more money. But do something before Captain March goes back to Washington and scratches my plane off the list. I'm sorry, Cass. I know what that plane means to you and how valuable it'd be to the Navy. But there are only six or seven test pilots capable of giving your ship the beating the Navy will demand before the design is accepted. I've communicated with all of them. They feel that the plane that killed Steve Connor can't be any good. Those men will risk their lives, but they won't commit suicide. Then there isn't anything to be done? No. I'm sorry, Cass. Who is it? Hello, Irene. Where's Cass? Is he here? 
Uh, no, I haven't seen him since yesterday. Oh, well, maybe he's heard the news and he's avoiding me. What news? In me, Irene, you observe a man of consequence, a person of vast importance. In other words, a Navy hotshot. Suppose you tell me what it's all about. Honolulu, I've been given command of a big boat, and I'm going to take it on the mass flight from here to there. Oh, congratulations, Jerry. Yeah, and wait till Cass hears about it. Will he be mortified? After I rub it in for a while, we'll go out and celebrate, huh? What's wrong, Irene? Nothing. Only I wouldn't plan on rubbing it in, Jerry. I wouldn't plan on a celebration either. You don't think I meant it, do you? Well, I know you're just kidding. Cass has changed. He's abnormally sensitive. He's always brooding. And when I try to cheer him up, he just gets irritable. Mm, it's that plane of his, huh? Looks as if it's going to be abandoned. And if it is, he'll lose everything he wants out of life. Ah, it's not that important, Irene. He'll get over it, and he'll have a lot left to live for, too. He'll have you, won't he? That isn't enough. Can you understand that? No. I didn't at first. I made a bargain. I accepted a job. And I believed that by merely accepting it, I had accomplished it. Jerry, I did everything I could to make Cass happy. And I failed. I'm not important to him. That's not true, Irene. Cass loves you. I think he does. But he's never reconciled himself to being out of the Navy. He feels that he's only half a man. That he's a failure. That plane is a symbol to him. If he puts the Navy's colors on its wings, then he'll be in the service again. He won't mind being crippled. He'll be happy. And if the plane's a failure, he'll die slowly inside. And there's nothing I can do about it. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I can now. You know, Irene, a long time ago, I, I gave up something I wanted very much. And since then, I've been so busy feeling sorry for myself that I never considered that there were two sides to the bargain. I can't come close to matching what you've done, but the least I can do is try. If there's any way in the world of putting Navy colors on Cass's plane, I'll do it. Hello, Cass. This is Brown. Listen, we've got a man to test the plane. You better get down here right away. He'll be at the field in an hour. You ready, Jerry? In a minute, as soon as the doc gets finished here. I'll be out at the ship. Make it snappy. What do you say, Doc? How am I doing? Oh, we'll be through in a minute. Stay in steel. i got to tape up your waist. What for? Keep your insides in place. Hold that pad right there. And draw on your stomach. You'll want this good and tight. <laughs> hey, hey, take it easy, will you? Better than having your insides fall out. Now, put on your shirt. Put this belt over your flying suit. It'll help. It'll be a good idea to yell as hard as you can before you pull out of the dive. Yell? Why? Well, that'll tighten your throat and stomach muscles still more and keep oh. your arteries from puffing up. Here, take this scarf. Keep it around your neck. When the time comes, tighten that as much as you can. It'll stop the blood from draining out of your head. <laughs> there sure is a lot to remember in this racket, isn't there? Well, you better remember all of it. Or you'll never pull out of that dive. All right, go ahead. Thanks, Doc. waiting for, Mac. Where's the test pilot? Now, take it easy, Cass. He'll be here in a minute. Who is he? Is he any good? I think he's great. Sure. So do I. Hello, Jerry. Say, listen, I... Hey, what's the idea of that outfit? Well, test pilots have got to dress like this. It's a union rule. You mean you're going to take that ship up? Of course I am. I'm your pilot, mister. Well, you can't. It's against regulations for Navy men to test planes. You'll be thrown out of the service. I'm not in the Navy anymore. What? I resigned my commission. You resigned? You mean you quit the Navy just so that... You... Well, I won't let you do it. It's already done, Cass. What about the Honolulu flight? Ah, that was just a joyride. This will be a lot more fun. Don't be a fool, Jerry. You don't know what you're up against. You haven't the experience. You'll be... Yeah, yeah, I know, Papa. Now, will you run along and mind your own business? Will you go and take that junk off? That plane's not going up today. Listen, Cass, for a long time I've been trying to convince you that I'm a better flyer than you were in your best day. Today I'm going to prove it, and in your ship. Kill that motor, Mac. No, no, look, Cass. I'm taking that crate up even if I have to knock you cold to do it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come here. Come here. Mac, take care of this guy, will you? Cass. Cass. Take your hands off. Will you take your hands off? Let me alone. I've got to do it, Cass. I don't want to, but i got to. Hurry up, Jerry, will you? On my way. So long, Cass. Jerry! Jerry! Look at that ship climb. I just heard about Jerry. Cass, you can't let him do it. Well, he's doing it now. That's him up there. Cass. 
If anything should happen to him. If anything should happen to Jerry. When I tried to stop him, I couldn't. He may be killed. He may be... Okay. Well, there's nothing we can do about it now except to hope. Just about ready. There he goes. You know when a test pilot goes through when he makes a terminal velocity dive? Open your throttle and shoot yourself in the earth like a cannonball. This is to keep your insides in place. You're smashed back in your seat. You gasp for air. The wind is like a thousand nine. You rip and tear at your wings. You're going 400 miles an hour. Straight down. Put this bell on. Straight down. Better to have your insides fall out. 400 miles an hour. Straight down. The air's turned into a brick wall. Yell as hard as you can before you pull out. All of a sudden, your plane and your body are shooting upward. Yell as hard as you can. Your blood drains. You can't see. You can't breathe. You're knocked out cold. You're knocked out cold. You're knocked out cold. And if you're lucky, you come to before you crash. If you're lucky, you come to. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, if you're lucky. Great ship. Congratulations, Lieutenant. Thank you, sir. Oh, Irene, did it. Jerry, he did it. He gave my ship to the Navy. He's safe. Oh, Cass, he's safe. If only you'd try to understand, Captain. The kid loves the service as much as any man ever did. Yes, I'm sure yeah, But this Honolulu Lulu flight, sir, is the most important thing in his life. He gave it all up for me. Please hold up that resignation, sir. If not for my sake, for the sake of the old man. If he were alive, it would be awfully important to have one Harrington left in the Navy. I'm washed up, and Jerry's the only one to carry on. Please, sir. The Honolulu flight leaves tomorrow. I'll see that your brother has his command. Thank you, sir. Yes, I don't see Jerry. Do you suppose they've decided not to let him go? Wait a minute. Oh, there he is. Jerry! Jerry! Hi, Cass. Hello, Irene. Are they taking you, kid? That's my boat right over there. Great. You know, I hate to admit this, but I'm kind of proud of you, Jerry. Well, thanks. I've been waiting to hear you say that for a long time. Well, I've said it, so don't make me change my mind. And remember, only one Irishman got away with flying backward, so don't wind up in Cuba. Well, I've checked my compass. It'll be on a little or nothing. It better be. And remember, the water is soft unless you hit it hard, so don't get wet. I'll try not to. Well, I... I guess I'd better get going. So long, kid. Good luck. Thanks. Goodbye, Irene. Goodbye, Jerry. Lots of happiness to, to both of you. So long. He's gone, Cass. I hope he's happy. He will be. Tomorrow a clipper ship takes off for Honolulu... You'll be on it. I'll be. Yes, you. Now that I'm cured, I'm firing the nurse. <laughs> That's gratitude for you, isn't it? Cass. No, no, let's not have any arguments. I'm sending you to Honolulu so I won't have to support you for the rest of my life. Oh, Cass. You know, don't you? Sure. Something I should have had sense enough to see long ago. Oh, please don't think that I'm hurt or angry or that I feel cheated. Having known you for a little while gave me more happiness than I'll ever deserve. Oh, Cass. Oh, Cass. And in the skies an armada of steel and thunder, graceful battleships of the clouds, wings of the Navy. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille will bring our stars back for their curtain calls. In the meantime, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap have asked me to make this special announcement to the members of our Lux Radio Theater audience. They urge all of you who have not already done so to send in for your Scarlet O'Hara brooch at once. This is the last time we will make this offer on the Lux Radio Theater. Now, surely you don't want to miss out on this opportunity to own the lovely Scarlet O'Hara brooch. We know you'll be delighted with this stunning jewelry piece when you see it. 
So note these instructions carefully if you haven't already sent in for your Scarlet O'Hara brooch. Buy three cakes of Lux toilet soap from your dealer. Ask him for an order blank. Or write your name and address on a piece of paper and enclose it in an envelope with the three Lux toilet soap wrappers and 15 cents in coin. No stamps, please. Address to Lux toilet soap, Box 1, New York City. I'll repeat that. Lux toilet soap, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. And now, Mr. DeMille is bringing our stars back to the microphone. The curtain has fallen on wings of the Navy, and if I had my way, George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and John Payne would get a 21-gun salute for their performance tonight. Thank you, Mr. DeMille, but I'm a little doubtful about that many guns. Yes, I'm afraid that salute is reserved for the Commander-in-Chief, C.B., all right, George, we'll make it 17. That's only an admiral's, but I still think you deserve 21. <laughs> you know, when we made this picture, Mr. DeMille, we were practically in the Navy for a couple of months, and we really saw what makes the flying service tick. Yeah, the fellas that run one of those big flying boats don't spend much time in saluting. It takes both hands to handle that job. One look at the instrument panel of a big boat completely confused me. It looked like 50 clocks, all with a different time. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the reasons it takes so much training to make a Navy pilot. <clears throat> training and a smart pupil. Mr. DeMille, we've all had a grand time coming back to the Lux Radio Theater this week, and I'd like to say one thing more. Lux soap is the complexion care I use every day, and I wouldn't be without it. And from my own experience, I know it's a soap that's really gentle. And those words ought to be sufficient for the wise, Olivia, because Lux soap never had a lovelier recommendation. And right now, I'd like to recommend our play for next Monday night. What is the bill, Mr. DeMille? Next week, John is one of the most distinguished weeks in the history of the Lux Radio Theater. A great star makes her first appearance at this microphone, Miss Shirley Temple. Our play, is <laughs> Our play is one that many of you have asked for time after time, with Shirley in the leading role. It's The Littlest Rebel, a story of a little girl who taught two armies the meaning of gallantry. With Shirley in The Littlest Rebel, we present two fine actors, Claude Rains and Preston Foster. And we think that makes next Monday night a night to write home about. Well, you can't beat a combination like Shirley Temple, Claude Rains and Preston Foster and the Littlest Rebel, C.B. We'll be right at the radio listening, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Goodbye. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs> and happy landing. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Shirley Temple, Claude Rains, and Preston Foster in The Littlest Rebel. It's a Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Tristram Coffin as Harry White, Lou Merrill as Mac, Gail Gordon as Speaker, Stuart Buchanan as Dr. Harper, Earl Ross as Captain Brown, Stanley Farrar as Captain March, Wally Mayer as Reporter, Frank Richards as Steve, and James Eagles as Ormsby. Here's an important announcement. Uncle Jim's Question Bee, which so many of you enjoy, will now be on the air Tuesday nights beginning October 8th instead of Wednesday. See your local newspaper or radio magazine for details. George Brent and Olivia de Havilland appeared tonight through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio. Mr. Brent will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Honeymoon for Three, and Mr. Havilland's forthcoming picture is Santa Fe Trail at the same studio. John Payne was heard through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox and is currently appearing on the screen in their production of Maryland. The Scarlet O'Hara brooch offered you by the makers of Lux Toilet Soap is designed after one worn by Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind, the Selznick International picture produced by David O. Selznick and released by Metro Golden Mayer. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>